Joel lied to Ellie. Because of her, they were actually going to make a cure. The only catch, it would kill her. I saved her. No! In order to save the life he had grown to love, in his desperation, he massacred many for the life of one. She needed her immunity to mean something. I told her her immunity meant nothing. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. Maybe I just wanted to do right by her. I swear. Okay. Ellie begrudgingly accepted those words. But our lies and our actions have a way of bubbling under the surface, accruing a debt that must one day be paid. After that lie, Ellie and Joel settled into a life in Jackson. Jackson, a community set up by Maria and her father. Maria then met Tommy, Joel's brother, who helped build and grow the community. To build walls and lookout towers to keep them safe, schools, churches, and meat trading points to enrich their minds and bodies. They even had electricity that powered theatres and dances to keep them entertained. It's five years later now, the world still has some dangers, risk of human aggression and of course the infected that sporadically plague the perimeter of the community and beyond. In the community, Ellie has been nurtured by Joel and the elders of the group. She has kept her immunity a secret, chemically masked her bite mark and covered with a tattoo. She's made a good life here with good friends like Jesse and Dina. The night before, everything changed. Her relationship with Dina took a step towards romance. Every guy in this room is staring at you right now. Maybe they're staring at you. It was a union not without its complications. Dina had recently broken up with Jesse, a relationship that had been on and off for a while. Although hurt by the breakup, Dina and Jesse both knew the relationship had run its course. Joel, although burdened with a lie to protect, had found a peace in Jackson. A routine helping patrol the camp's perimeter, his spare time cultivating his passions of wildlife, reading and woodwork, as well as imbibing the interests of Ellie in a bid to stay connected. His primary driver was watching over Ellie, mostly from a distance as she grew from a girl into a woman. He wanted her to grow up safe, educated. Remember now, don't just flail about. You Close gotta- the water with your whole arm, blah, blah, blah. Glad to know I'm getting through. Happy and enriched. Oh my God, it is a dinosaur! Joel! Surprise. In contrast to all they had been through and the life she knew back in Boston QZ. On the night of the dance, he was there to step in as Seth took exception to that kiss on the dance floor. Oh, just what this town needs. Another loudmouth dyke. The fuck did you just say? Ellie, hey. Ellie, don't. Get the hell out of here. You all right, kiddo? What is wrong with you? He had no right. And you do? I don't need your fucking help, Joel. Because throughout the five years since St. Mary's Hospital, the loss of her destiny would resurface and manifest itself in mistrust of Joel's recount of what happened. She would continue to probe for answers. I had so many questions for them. Why did you pull me out of there while I was still unconscious? There was no cure. She kept getting the wrong answers. A year before that kiss, Ellie travelled back to St. Mary's Hospital in search of the right answers. She found them. Even if we found her, or by some miracle found someone else that's immune, it made no difference, because the only person who could develop a vaccine is dead. If you lie to me one more time, I'm gone. You will never see me again. She hears the truth she always knew in her heart. Oh my god. I'll go back, but we're done. The paradox of continued existence, but the pain and guilt of surviving against her destiny of purpose would end their ties, but Joel would continue to watch over Ellie. The morning after the dance, Joel was out patrolling near the ski resort with Tommy, while Ellie was out with Dina, covering the creek trails. No one could have protected Ellie or Joel from what the storm brought into the mountains of Jackson. A group, hold up, at a nearby mansion, all members of an unknown group, the WLF, the Washington Liberation Front. <laughs> if you enjoy this video, leave a like. If you are not subscribed, make sure you are. And if you would like to support the expansive work that goes into these videos, you can do so via Patreon, where you'll find numerous tiers with numerous benefits, all helping me produce these videos full time. 
And if you want to watch me discover this story in real time, take a look at my blind playthrough on the card now and link in the description. Also in the description are playlists of other videos delving deeper into the world of The Last of Us. I'm The Patient Wolf and this is The Story of The Last of Us Part 2. We made it. Holy shit. It's a fucking city. They had travelled 800 miles from Seattle to find one man. While out searching, a member of that group, Abby Anderson, quite by chance, gets that man right where she wants him. Oh! We're gonna have to run! Who here? A storm and a horde brings Tommy and Joel to her aid. I'm Tommy. That's Joel. What's your name? Abby. My friends are at a mansion just north of You'd run with me. Abby's group are surprised to see Abby return with two men. But on hearing his name, Joel, they know what they must do. Joel Miller. Who are you? Guess. Joel has an inkling, but the life he has had to lead to survive, it could be any number of people looking for payback. You stupid old man. You don't get to rush this. Joel! Tommy! Joel's life is in the balance. And with the news Joel and Tommy didn't show up for the changeover with Jesse, Ellie is one of the number in search for him. She happens upon the mansion. Get her down! Get off me! End it. Now. Oh, please get up! No! As Joel's life is ended, the trauma of what she has witnessed envelops her. She doesn't know why her and Tommy were spared, but a vacuum has been left. A deeply complicated but vital relationship has been ripped from her and all that is left is rage. There is only one response she can fathom and that is revenge. Despite the protestations from Tommy, who has had his own counsel in Maria. Is this you talking or is this her? If it were you or me, Joel would be halfway to Seattle already. Washington Liberation Front, that's what you said was on those patches. Ellie is resolved to make the trip to Seattle with Dina. You go, I go, end of story. Ellie agrees to wait one more day so Tommy can try to turn Maria around and sanction the trip. But whether it's his own need for revenge or a bid to protect Ellie from the same fate, he takes a horse and heads alone to Seattle without telling Ellie or Maria. In desperation, Maria allows Ellie and Dina to leave too, with Ellie's horse, Shimmer. Do me a favor and bring my dumbass husband home in one piece, please. The journey to Seattle was long. They came across campfires, possibly from Tommy. They can only be a day or two behind him, they arrive at the gates of the Seattle QZ, find a map and scale the walls to find as far as the eye can see, the place is deserted. No WLF to be seen. It's peaceful out here at least. It's weird being in a QZ and not hearing gunfire and explosions. They find access codes for many gates in the enormous QZ and a note speaking to a WLF presence at the Saravina Hotel. But to progress, they need fuel for the generator, so they head into the downtown area to find it. In their searching, notes and letters they find paint a picture of the rise of the WLF in Seattle. Unlike the Fireflies in Boston, they were successful in toppling FEDRA, the government agency that took over after the pandemic, and that conflict gave rise to a new WLF leader in Isaac. A man praised for making the hard choices and the hard measures to obtain liberty from their perceived oppressors. Hey, check this out. Seattle traded one shitty ruler for another. We got gasoline. Our luck's changing. They reached the Seravina to infected and dead WLF soldiers with signs of human aggression. They've been shot. What the fuck happened here? Tommy did this. He's one of the ones that killed Joel. This was Nick. He was with Abby's group in Jackson. Also, there was Jordan. He took Ellie's knife to the face. His girlfriend, Leah, Nora, Abby's best friend, Manny, her former boyfriend, Owen, and Owen's now pregnant girlfriend, Mel. Tommy had ended Nick's life and in doing so, attained the code to progress through the QZ. Tommy relying on the brutality of the trick Joel exhibited in Colorado all those years ago. I know you said Tommy had a rough past, but fuck. I say we find shelter and we set up camp. Maybe somewhere high up so we can scope out the area. The WLF. Shimmer dead. 
Ellie overpowered, but Dina rolls away to safety. Didn't think I'd ever see you again. Jordan, with the legacy of Ellie's blade on his face, interrogates as to who else is in this avenging party. You can't stop this. <laughs> on searching the body of Jordan, Ellie finds a photograph and a note to another name among those visiting Jackson. Leah. Isaac's got us posted up on a two-week at the TV station. Scars spotted in the area. Spy all these tall buildings. That way. The TV station is their destination, but what are scars? Let's go get Leah. On the way, they see more evidence about the scars, this unmet faction, and a discontent among the WLF soldiers that current orders across the board are to fall back to base. For what purpose? It took us months to secure this zone. Higher-ups know what they're doing. As they arrive at the TV station, they encounter people shot by arrows, and more gruesome still, WLF strung up, disemboweled, and symbols daubed in blood. Searching through the station, they find Leah. Guess the universe really wanted her dead, huh? And within her bag are photographs lovingly kept of the friends that accompanied her to Jackson. Three down, right? Three down. Those are Nick, Jordan, and now Leah, but Nora, Owen, Mel, Joel's killer Abby, and Manny still alive. That's new Jackson. Look at their fucking smiles. With the WLF closing in to investigate the attack, Ellie and Dina use the tunnels of the metro system to escape. All right, it'll work for now. Keep going. But they trade the WLF for infected. With spores abound, they don their masks. Look out! Just as Ellie thought she had a handle on the progression of the infection that plagues this world, her and Dina are presented with a new class of infected. An alternate fourth class that, when in close proximity, engulfs its targets with acidic clouds. This class has been dubbed as the Shambler. As if the others weren't bad enough. I'm really tired. Dina exhausted, but both wary and intent on reaching the surface. <laughs> Ellie, your mask! No! Ellie, no! Stop! I'm not infected! I'm immune! I'm not coughing, do you see? Shit. Can you run? Yeah. Let's fucking go! They make it to the surface, but this is taking it out of Dina. A fatigue that worries Ellie. You wanna tell me what's going on with you? What's going on with me? I'm immune. The fuck are you talking about? I was bitten and nothing happened. Now you know. Ellie, I think I'm pregnant. What? Don't worry, it's not yours. <laughs> How long have you known? I wasn't sure, okay? I didn't want to be a burden. Well, you're a burden now, aren't you? Her anger born out of a mixture of care for Dina and that she may soon have to choose between Dina and her thirst to make Abby and her group pay. From here on in, the theater will act as their base in Seattle. Dina is hampered by nausea. She can't accompany Ellie like she has until now. They rig up the wireless radio, tune in to the WLF comms, and from here, Dina can isolate activity relating to the remaining aggressors. They found our mess at the school. This guy, Owen, he went AWOL. What about her? Nothing yet. Negative on scars. Lone male trespasser. Arm. Lone male trespasser? Tommy. With a lead on Tommy, Ellie is to head out alone to his presumed location. Dina gives Ellie a keepsake. It's for good luck. I don't believe in luck. I do. Hillcrest is a community that held out during the infection, through the military occupation and the civil war against the WLF. But the WLF taking over did not produce the freedom that some would hope. At one stage, they ordered residents to move inside the walls of their stadium so as to protect them better. Some rose up, but to little effect. The WLF own this town and are out in force in Hillcrest, now looking for this lone male trespasser, Tommy. Go, go! Don't let him escape! As she nears the conflict, the man at its center is not Tommy, but Jesse. What the hell are you doing here? Glad to see Jesse, but Tommy is still at large and they need to get out of the firefight with the WLF. See that truck? You ready? Free of danger, they return to the theater. Oh my God. 
Jesse. Hey, Dina. How? Oh. While Ellie was away, Dina discerned the whereabouts of another member of the party in Jackson. Abby? No. This girl. Nora? She is located at the hospital collecting supplies with her unit. What, you're gonna go now? We know her location. Maybe Tommy does too. What? Nothing. Good. Dina sees a determination in Ellie that scares her. With Dina's momentum waning, Ellie's is ramping up the closer she gets to Abby. Get off of me! Dragged down by a stalker, she emerges from the sewers into another threat. Ellie finally meets the scars. <laughs> Known to themselves as the Seraphites, a religious cult giving praise to the founder of their faith, the Prophet. They free their enemies nested in sin by disemboweling them. Now he is free. Ellie is not here for them, but to get to the hospital, Ellie will need to get through them. <laughs> Ellie uses the Seattle floods to enter the hospital, learns the whereabouts of Nora and works her way to the upper floors. While crawling through the air ducts, she hears word that Abby's whereabouts are unknown. Nora is being pressed as to where she is. When Isaac talks to us about this, I'm gonna say what I think happened. Knock yourself out, I've got work to do. Don't scream. You remember me? What do you want? Abby was here earlier. Where'd she go? We could have killed you. Maybe you should have. Or maybe you should have stayed the fuck out of Jackson. <laughs> Ellie gives chase under WLF fire and rather than be caught, elects to drag Nora with her down to the infected and spore-ridden lower floors. <laughs> Ellie finds Nora, coughing, infected. You're breathing spores. You're her. Nora knows now who Ellie really is. She, along with the rest of the group that travelled to Jackson, were Fireflies. Joining the WLF after the Fireflies voted to disband, after Joel intervened for Ellie. Think about what he did. How many people are dead because of him? Joel not only took away the source of the immunity, but the only man that could utilise it. No! And that man also had a daughter. Her name was Abby. Is he still in the fucking building? No! Abby, don't look. Dad! Dad! <laughs> Ellie does not know details of what individually any of them lost, but collectively, Ellie had known in her heart that that day at St. Mary's Hospital that resulted in the end of the Fireflies was the reason for his death. But this knowledge had no bearing on her rage. It's so strong there is no room for the minds of others. And the only person she needs to see die is Abby. She arrives back at the theatre with the location of Abby extracted from Nora with bloody force marked on her map. Back at the theatre, Dina is struggling. Jesse instinctively knows she's pregnant with his child. She needs real care and she's not going to get that. Yeah, I know. But I can't just leave Tommy. Maybe you could take her back. She's not going to leave without you. Let's get down. They decide to head for the aquarium, the last known whereabouts of Abby, in case Tommy has the same intel. Jesse hopes they can intercept him there. Ellie content that her mission for Tommy and Abby are still aligned. Jesus, how the hell are we crossing this? Between them and the aquarium is an impassable expanse of water. The highway is occupied by wolves, so they decide to commandeer a boat. As they get closer to the boat, they overhear news of a trespasser at the marina. Sniper spotted in 12. It can only be Tommy. We can get to the marina through here. No, we're taking the boat. If it is him, he'll be gone by the time we get there. Abby is where he'll be headed, so if we just what fall... What if he's in trouble? He can take care of himself. Jesse can now see what Dina has seen growing in Ellie, the closer she has gotten to her target. Ellie's drive for revenge that now trumps anything and anyone else, including the retrieval of her only living connection to the father she lost, Tommy. I really hope you make it. And like Dina, Jesse sees no use in trying to persuade her. He heads for Tommy. Ellie gets the boat. There. The floods form rapids that take Ellie closer to the aquarium. As she nears, the rains turn to storm and the waves wash Ellie up on the shore of the last known location of Abby. Stupid dog. 
There is no immediate sign of anyone else, but there are sleeping bags, WLF bags, a firefly pendant belonging to Owen, bloody rags. Someone was hurt. She hears voices. People don't come back from that island. I'm not fucking going there. Then don't! Ellie gets to drop on them. You're that girl from Jackson. Tell me where she went. Point to where she is on this map. It better fucking match up. Fucking Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Tell me where Abby is. Where the fuck is she? <laughs> With the revelation that Mel was carrying a child, an innocent, the realization of her actions, and the trauma her revenge has kept at bay envelops her. Jesse and Tommy arrive and take her back to the theater, their base of operations, but Ellie left the map. Ellie is back with Dina. Despite her rage, she has perspective now that she still has people she loves. They plan their return to Jackson. They got what they deserved. But she gets to live. Yeah. Is that okay? It has to be. Tommy heads off to prepare. How you doing? Fine. Thanks for coming back for me. My friend's problems are my problems. Oh, shit! Jesse, stand up! Hands in the air, I shoot this one too. Stop! Stop! I know why you killed Joel. He did what he did to save me. There is no cure because of me. I am the one that you want. You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it! Back in Jackson, Abby had not got the satisfaction she hoped from killing Joel and avenging her father, but she was content to move on and grieve. Stop! We're done! But in doing so, she released that same rage in Ellie. Now Abby's friends are dead, and she has the person responsible in her sights. <laughs> on returning to Seattle, for Abby and her friends, life returned to normal. She still had a city to control and protect. The Washington Liberation Front live as many communities do in this post-apocalyptic world. They have taken the Seattle Stadium as their home. Within it, they are well protected. They train, their children learn and play, and they grow the crops and livestock to feed their growing populace. They are a warring faction led by Isaac. They have been making good ground against the Seraphites of late, but a recent truce has been broken and the conflict has escalated. Abby! <gasps> oh, been searching everywhere for you. We've been called up. Isaac wants us at the front. Isaac has given orders for all soldiers and medical personnel to give up ground and return to the operation base for further orders. They are starved of information and rumors are flying. Can you fucking believe after everything we're falling back? I'm telling you, we're leaving the QZ. I heard the big man's had enough. Manny and Abby are heading to the FOB and Manny has contrived that Mel comes along too. Why are you doing this to me? Because I care about both of you. Mel and Abby have been friends since kids with the Fireflies, but Mel is with Abby's ex, Owen now. A relationship that could not survive Abby's yearning for payback against Joel. Since that brutal payback, her and Abby have developed a rift between them. Manny hopes this journey will start the repair to this rift. Hi. Hey. Let's keep moving. As the journey is longer than advertised, they attempt to reconcile. I am glad I'm here with you guys. I hate to hear you got in trouble and I couldn't help. I guess I was shook by Jackson too. One of their number and Mel are hurt. Back to the medics at the FOV. Abby and Manny check in. What you got for us? No assignment. Just says report to Isaac. Never been this busy here. Something's going down. We better find Isaac. We should make sure Mel's okay first. As Nora treats Mel, she asks for a moment to share something away from her. I'm shipping out to the Westside Hospital in a few. Orders are to get everything. I need to show you guys something. Follow me. Amongst the many dead from the conflict awaiting burial is a body bag containing Danny. Not a former firefly, but a soldier that was out with Owen responding to a report of Seraphite activity. Owen is still missing, 
but Danny made it back to the wolves and died in Isaac's arms bearing a message. As far as I can tell, there's no units going back that way. Worried, Abby resolves to find out why no one is searching for Owen when she reports to Isaac. Isaac is in the apartments, a prison, a place long used for the WLF to hold and forcibly interrogate captured Seraphites. After our morning, I wouldn't mind a few minutes with these guys. They catch up with Isaac, questioning a scar. They find out the reason for the pullback. These small skirmishes can't keep going like this. Sick of another failed truce, Isaac has a plan to attack their island with full force to end the conflict once and for all and eradicate the Seraphites. It's a big storm a few days out. We're going to use it to mask our approach. You two are going to lead the first wave. Abby uses the opportunity to ask after Owen. He shot Danny, apparently to protect some scar. It's bullshit. Excuse me? Let me go after him. I'll walk him back in. We'll get to the No, bottom. we've only got one shot at this. And this is bigger than any of us. Definitely bigger than Owen. Abby appears to concede, but inside she knows what she must do. If Owen's out there, how the hell are you going to find him? I know where he'll go. Shortly after joining the WLF, Abby and Owen, then a couple, had happened upon the aquarium. Oh my god. You don't see that every day. It was empty, but a family had for a time lived here and thrived, and had since remained untouched. <coughs> In the outdoor theatre was moored their yacht. Owen especially fell in love with the place, and it was to become his haven that he shared with Abby for a time, and later grew more attached to it with Mel. He felt a special kinship with Max, the boy who had lived here before, who left his art on every wall. Max, with his brother, had joined the Seraphites. I'd love to meet this kid. He's a scar. Maybe you have. Ah, Jesus, I sure hope not. I just don't understand how anybody willingly joins the scars. Well, in the QZs, people would refer to the Fireflies as terrorists. We blew up checkpoints and assassinated soldiers. Owen, as a Firefly, felt purpose. A purpose he has not been able to replicate as part of the WLF. It is at the aquarium the Christmas before they left for Jackson that he discusses the rumor that the Fireflies are reforming in Santa Barbara, California, a notion that Abby counseled to discount. Manny sees Abby off to go after Owen. Wish me luck. When you find him, don't hit him too hard. Abby despises the Seraphites nearly as much as Joel. You crazy bitch. Do you even know what you were starting? She has been in conflict with them ever since she arrived in Seattle. She has seen compatriots die and killed her fair share. Her journey across Seattle to the aquarium sees her pass through Martyr's Gate, a sacred place, a shrine to the prophet, the leader of their faith who had died at the hands of the WLF, a place they fight to hold off as they deliver their prayers to their lost leader, a note of thanks, a hope for a better life. In reading these, Abby reluctantly gains a better understanding of her enemy. And as she runs into them, she overhears talk of runaways from the group and are keen to hunt them down. May our prophet grant justice to those apostates. Abby, unconscious, awakens. She is going to be subjected to the fate of her compatriots in the TV station. They are nested with sin. Free them, that they may know my... A timely occurrence is the news to the Seraphites that they have caught one of the runaways. Yara! Where is the other apostate? Clip her wings. The runaways' names are Lev and Yara. They free Abby. Ordinarily a sworn enemy, but for now, their purpose is aligned to flee the Seraphites and the infected attracted by the gunshot. <laughs> Fading fast from her smashed arm, Abby carries Yara to safety. In here. <laughs> Resets the arm, and with a mind still set on the Aquarian, she leaves them. Thanks for cutting me down. Whatever shape she's in, I need to get out of here by tomorrow. We'll be fine. The aquarium is locked, but she finds a way inside and heads for the lamp-lit boat, eager to find out why Owen would attack his own, and for the sake of a Seraphite. You want to tell me what happened? I couldn't do it. 
Owen could not kill another Seraphite for a cause he did not believe in. Danny's militant loyalty took exception and his death was a consequence of Owen's self-defence. Owen is done with the WLF. I'm going to Santa Barbara. The Chaser rumour? If the Fireflies are in Santa Barbara, I go the opposite fucking direction. Sorry I grew up. <sighs> you should try it. Oh yeah? How do I do that? Should I go find the people that killed my family? I could torture them until they're crying now. <laughs> <laughs> The morning brings an ease for Abby. More than the realisation she has reignited an old flame, now an expectant father. The unease is related to the young Seraphites she left vulnerable up the coast. Those fucking kids. Arriving back, Lev has seen off investigating Seraphites. Yara needs urgent medical attention. What are you doing? I'm giving her a chance. The closest help there is is back at the aquarium. Mel is back. A close call for Owen and Abby. She assesses the damage to Yara's arm. I was going to clean it and try resetting. The bone's shattered. She has compartment syndrome. A critical diagnosis. The arm must be removed. They don't have the equipment or supplies to remove it safely. The WLF occupied hospital is potentially two days there and back with the current conditions. She doesn't have a couple of days. What if I can get you there in two hours? Abby needs to help these kids. She leaves with deep concern from Owen. Abby and the desire to keep the flame they ignited the previous night. I don't care about last night. Well, I do. On their way to Lev's shortcut, they meet Seraphites. During combat, Abby hears a name. Shit. It's Lily! Did you hear what they called me? Once called Lily, and having struggled with his gender identity, Lev, against strict Seraphite rules, shaved his head from the braided hair to live as a boy. He aspired to be a soldier like his sister, but was to be married to an elder, a fate he could not fathom. Their mother, a strict servant to their faith, banished him, as did the group at large. Accompanied by his sister Yara, they were estranged from the group as apostates, renouncers of their religion and hunted for their crime. But despite the hatred, Lev still clings to a faith that grounds him. He draws strength to his character by the sage teaching of its founder, a woman dubbed as the prophet. Her writings don't have violence in them. We weren't stoning or hanging people until after she died. They're taking her words and twisting them. Abby, having always seen the scars through hatred, now has a view of them through a different lens, through Lev. Only when weak may I carry my true strength. What the fuck is that? In helping Abby, Lev has revealed a Seraphite secret. To avoid the wolves, infected and fallen buildings, they have formed a sky bridge, often hidden from view due to the persistent Seattle clouds. I don't know if I can do this. Finding her true strength, overcoming her fear of heights and an unplanned deviation through relentless infected, they reach the hospital. I'm gonna go in the front door, grab the stuff, come right back. You're staying here, yeah? I need to grab some medical supplies. I'm doing a thing for Isaac. Those at the hospital don't know of Isaac's insistence that Abby stay at the FOB, but after checking her story as to why she was there, she is apprehended on Isaac's orders. She's been AWOL since yesterday. Shit. Hey! Crying out for release, she summons. <laughs> Loyal to Abby, she releases her, explaining that these supplies have left for the FOB in readiness for their invasion of the Seraphite Island, but she has an idea. We haven't cleared out the lower floors yet. Since the WLF have occupied the hospital, they have not dared to enter the lower floors. This hospital was ground zero as the pandemic rose in Seattle. Due to the number of infected, it was safer just to close them in. Those infected within have been entombed for 25 years. But that is Abby's surest bet. If all else fails, the ambulances in the parking basement may hold what she needs. May your survival be long. May my death be swift. What the fuck is that? On bringing the power back online to ease her passage, Abby finds the supplies to save Yara. Oh, thank God. But in doing so, unleashes a phenomenon. Ah! The Rat King. 
tightly packed in an atmosphere of spores and fungus, these infected have evolved and conjoined to form a mass of infected bodies. It attacks with extreme strength. Those that separate from it have the agility of stalkers, but the mycotoxin projectiles of a bloater. Abby overcomes her toughest infected encounter yet. Fuck this place. And returns to the aquarium with Lev. As Yara's operation is completed, Lev is keen to see her. They're just kids. I know. What happened to us? If maybe we stopped looking for the light. The gradual realization of Owen's mindset arrives to Abby all at once. Seeing through the hatred she had for the Seraphites and the anger at the loss of her father, she has found a glimpse of peace. Like Owen, she is no longer a wolf. But what is their purpose now? Owen is convinced it is finally fixing the boat and heading down the coast to Santa Barbara to find the fireflies. He asks Lev and Yara if they want to come. But despite his impending fatherhood, Owen's heart lies with Abby. I know it's a fucking mess, but we can choose to be happy. And Mel knows this. I figure you'd have talked him out of going by now. Actually, I'm going with them. But not if you come. You want to do right by these kids? Get out of their lives before you screw them over too. But those kids have their own friction to this trip to Santa Barbara. Yara knows in her heart that their devout mother will never accept either of them back in her life. Lev has a loyalty to his mother that cannot be broken. He will not leave her behind to risk the group turning on her. Lev! Get back here! What's he doing? He's going after her. After who? His mom. She's gonna kill him, Abby. Abby is compelled to save Lev from a certain fate. Yara, despite her recent amputation, needs to guide her. Due to his love for Abby, Owen is drawn to join them. Owen? I'm not gonna let her go by herself. Actually, you are. Be your priority straight. Despite her love for Owen, she makes the decision for them. She will not get between him and Mel, and the child they are about to bring to this world. While Owen turns his attention to the finishing touches on the yacht due for Santa Barbara, Abby and Yara head to the marina to find a boat for the island. On approaching, they hear gunfire. Yara hangs back while Abby investigates. Get down! <laughs> Abby, what the fuck? Manny, what are you doing out here? The boats. We were supposed to hit the island tonight. A sniper has laid waste to Manny's first wave team. I need one of those boats. Now. Why? Ask me later. Then I guess you're going to help me take this guy out. In doing so, Abby first hears about the trespassers that have plagued the WLF in the run-up to their invasion of the Seraphites. The last few days, they came out of nowhere. They're hitting us hard. Why? Don't know. It's right there! Go, 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 go! Manny. <laughs> Screw it. This is... <laughs> Her friend and roommate, Manny, is gone. She is now trapped in here with this sniper, this trespasser. Why are they here? <laughs> Abby recognizes the man as Joel's companion back in Jackson. As Tommy disappears beneath the waves, the enormity of this races through her, but she hasn't a moment to process it. They must save Lev. Through the storm that the wolves predicted, they've reached the island, but so do the WLF invasion. Isaac had sent scouts ahead for intel to help them in this mission. They did not return. If they had, Isaac would have known about the sheer numbers that live on the island and how organized they are. Isaac, wanting to use the storm as a cloak, goes ahead with the invasion anyway. As they head for Levin Yara's former home, Abby sees a community that she never imagined, like theirs, but living an antiquated existence. They had raised the buildings dwarfed by the iconic Space Needle. They live simply in wooden constructions, in loving communities with children, crops, livestock. Abby can't help but draw comparisons with the communities she has known. May her light guide us through the storm. When you're lost in the darkness, look for the light. What's that? Something my dad used to say. This is the one. Yara's fear had come true. Their mother no longer saw them as her children. I just tried talking to her. I tried to make her understand. She attacked Lev. In self-defense, their mother is now dead. It's gonna be okay, I promise. Lev's connection to the island, to the Seraphites, is gone. 
Now they can leave and sail for a new life. That's down the street. But the battle has started. They need to get to Haven, the largest settlement to get a boat back to the aquarium, then on to Santa Barbara. They run in to the wolves. Got one! Three seconds to get away from that scar. With her last act, no! What the fuck? Yara gives them the time to escape. Those were your fucking people. Hey, you're my people. Lev has lost his mother and his sister one after the other. With their blood still on him, Abby counsels the need for self-preservation. We're gonna have to fight to get out of this, okay? And then I need you to show us to those boats. With Isaac dead and having underestimated the Seraphites, Abby and Lev navigate through a winner-takes-all conflict. And while Abby and Lev quietly float away through the noise back to the aquarium, the WLF, despite hurting the Seraphites, have lost everything. And when Abby and Lev enter the aquarium, she discovers that she has lost Owen. And as she looks at the map, a vengeful rage erupts once more. You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it! What? With an arrow to the knee and a bullet to the side of his face, Tommy is down, but Ellie breaks free. With a look from Lev, she is immediately reminded of the brief moment of release she experienced from her hatred. How she felt when she finally avenged her father, how that couldn't sate her grief and rage, and how she channeled that into a hatred of the Seraphites. In Lev's eyes, she resolves to end her cycle of rage here. Don't ever let me see you again. Back when Ellie and Dina arrived in Seattle, before they came across the WLF, they mused as to what their life would be if they could choose. Ellie's without a credible substitute coming to mind, she offered up her childhood dream of owning a space shuttle. Dina's was more down to earth. Dina wants to live simply on a farm. Months after Seattle, Ellie, Dina, and their son, JJ, occupy a farm not far from the Jackson community. It has fences to protect them, livestock and space for Ellie to create. They have peace, love, a purpose in JJ. The farm an ideal life for Dina, and it could be for Ellie too, but the trauma of her loss of Joel still haunts her. She suffers episodes that take her back to the room where Joel was brutally taken from her. Dina shows loving patience, but this does not help Ellie exercise her grief. As Ellie returns from one of her frequent escapes of solitude to hunt, there is a visitor waiting from Jackson, Tommy. Tommy survived the arrow and the bullet he received in Seattle, but he limps and has lost sight in one eye. If anyone knows what Ellie is going through, it is Tommy, because there is a rage in Tommy now that he is not able to quell. Not only has he lost mobility and sight, but he has lost his wife, Maria, no longer able to suffer his behaviour. Tommy has lost the anchor that kept him so steady for the years since he met her. After his time surviving with Joel, the things he did and endured as a firefly, and now alone with grief and rage and trauma now directed in one place, Abby. After much searching, he has a lead on her and Lev in California. Although Tommy is turned down now, Ellie rises early, perceiving that this is the only way she knows to end the trauma she bears. I have to finish it. Stay. I can't. I'm not gonna do this again. That's up to you. Ellie leaves their farm, this time without a bracelet, without Dina's blessing. Dina is done. Okay, 
Constance. With nothing to keep them in Seattle, Abby and Lev have followed the lead Owen was so keen to investigate. The Firefly Outpost is supposed to be in this street, but it's deserted. Scratches. <laughs> Hello? Still deserted, but evidence of recent occupation and a wireless radio. This is Abby from Santa Barbara. Can anyone hear me? Hi, Abby. We got a clear signal on you. Where in Santa Barbara are you calling from? 24, 25 Constance. I was part of the Salt Lake outpost. Dr. Jerry Anderson, he was my dad. How do we find you? Get to Catalina Island. Approach the large domed building in Avalon. We'll find you. A needle in a haystack, but they have found the Fireflies. In California, but the Fireflies are not the only faction to exist here. There are others. <laughs> The Rattlers, a group that capture people, enslave them, and put them to work. They have captured Abby and Lev. The yacht, beached on the coast near Santa Barbara, has been found by Ellie. On board, there are clues as to Abby's whereabouts. 2425 Constance. Yeah, that's gotta be it. As she arrives at Constance, <laughs> Abby. She is met by the Rattlers. Wait, 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 wait. You're looking for an Abby, right? Talk. She's in a holding cell at our camp. We keep him in the tall, round building. Although injured, Ellie gets through the Rattlers guarding the slave workers to the round building, to the holding pen. Where's Abby? Abby tried to escape. She's down in the pillars. Head down to the beach. You won't miss it. She's probably already dead. Ellie has traveled so far. She wants Abby dead, but how will it feel if it's not by her hands? Abby is alive. It's you. She is beaten, battered, emaciated, close to broken. But her first thought is for Lev. This way. Two boats await them. This is not how she imagined this going. But as Joel's dying face flashes in her mind, she's come too far to not do what she feels will abate this trauma. This obsession must have its end. I can't let you leave. I'm not doing this. No. I'm not gonna fight you. Yes, she will. He's not a part of this. You made him a part of this. Okay. As Ellie has the final few moments of Abby's life in her hands, she is not feeling triumph. Her rage is not qualified by Abby's impending death. Instead, she glimpses a moment of the father she lost, a time the evening before his death that she has been unable to cherish due to the rage she has felt. Would Joel have wanted this? After ripping Ellie from the hands of the Fireflies, killing all those people, destroying a hope for humanity, had Joel not prepared himself for that moment? In the chalet, in the snow. He had salved the wound left open since his lost daughter Sarah 25 years prior. He had saved the daughter he loved in Ellie so she could feel love, security, joy. He had completeness. In Abby and Lev, Ellie also saw what it means to protect a life, to be totally devoted to someone's well-being. What Joel had for Ellie. Go. <laughs> oh. Take him. Abby takes Lev away on the boat now bound for Catalina Island. Ellie heads back with severed fingers. She looks on at a farm long deserted. The family she left and loves has returned to Jackson. All that is left are her possessions, drawings, diaries, and her guitar. Ellie's severed fingers mean she can no longer play her guitar as she used to. The notes no longer ring true. 
Their music, this strong connection with Joel, has gone for now, but the memory of their last conversation before he died has not. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered, but you took that from me. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. Their last moment had been a resolution, a resolve for a better future. The loss of that was tied up in the trauma of losing him. But in her revenge, what else had she lost? What would she do now? Who has she got left? As she leaves the gift from Joel behind, we see the moth emblem that Joel was keen to restore when he first found it. The moth evokes macabre imagery of death, also of compulsion, as a moth relentlessly seeks the light at all costs. Also, like a butterfly, an image of rebirth. How will Ellie live her life from now on? On the opposite arm to her disfigured hand sits Dina's bracelet, only recently restored there. In this image is a hope of a life of peace and love, a life Joel always wanted for her. If you enjoyed this retelling of The Last of Us Part 2, leave a like. Subscribe and hit the bell to be informed of more retellings on their way soon. And if you know anyone that would enjoy this video, share it. Tag me on Twitter. And if you would like to contribute to the hundreds of hours these videos take, you can do so via Patreon through a range of tiers. The link here. Watch this next video. And until next time, I'm The Patient Wolf. And this has been the story of The Last of Us, part two.